Hey, everybody. Hi. <laughs> Welcome back. This is going to be another one of those series overviews that we like to do for yeah. series that we really care about. Because it's, it's very different to analyze an individual game deeply as opposed to just discussing a series overall. Mm -hmm. So are we going to discuss Thousand, the Thousand Arms series? Yes, we are here to discuss the Thousand Arms Ovra as it's yes. known. The seventh one is my favorite. I think the seventh one is really overrated. Yeah, most uh, people do. Yeah, the sixth one is where it's at. Mm -hmm. There's a universe out there somewhere where there are 7,000 arms games or more. 7,000 arms. 7,000 arms. Why was it called Thousand Arms? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I have nothing. I like you struggle as if I know <laughs> and I'm going to correct you when... Uh, because of the sheer Played. number of possibilities in that sure, game. Sure, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll buy that. No, we are here to talk about the Legend of Heroes Trails yes. series. In this episode, we'll be talking about the Trails in the Sky trilogy, although yeah. I don't really think it's a trilogy. It's not. I actually agree with you. It's not a trilogy. It's It's an arc. I mean, it's... Yeah, it deals with the same characters, but no, it is not yeah, really that, a trilogy. Yeah, I'll, I'll repeat my feelings about the third game when we get to it. But none of them are. All the Trails games are in, like, duology form. It's just, they're, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, that's very true, They're, like, actually. in a duology, and then they have weird ones like Trails in the Sky the Third and the Trails of Reverie, which is not out yet in English, uh, that are, like, fan service kind of games. So. So uh, we first played Trails in the Sky a couple years ago mm -hmm. for Home on the RNG because Russ was really excited about well, it. Well, I played it in 2011 when the first Trails in the Sky was localized for the first time on the PSP and loved it. Yeah. Loved it. And I was very hesitant because he loved it so much. I was like, oh, God, this is going to be awful. Because <laughs> uh, I have awful taste in games. I get nervous whenever anybody is super enthusiastic about mm, something sure. because I assume they're wrong. <laughs> yeah. I just assume they're wrong <laughs> and that they have horrible taste. So we played the first one and I thought it was fine because it turns out I played it wrong. You did play it wrong. Yeah. I played it wrong. I played it like a JRPG. You just talk to all the NPCs once, you run around, do your missions, and then the story ends. The, the Trails universe is so dense with lore and characters and events Every NPC is really living their own story. Yeah. And any time that time advances, for the maximum experience, you have to talk to every NPC in the yes. world again. You didn't know that you had to talk to Mr. Reinen's mother, Bloom, every single time you advanced the story as she sought a wife for him and harassed all of the women of the town of Rolent. See, I didn't get that story at about all. About marrying her son. And then she ended up actually going on a trip around the country to look for a wife. And you would know that if you talked to her every single time <laughs> you saw her. And that's just one example. All of the characters have these rich, complex lives that are going on while you're busy trying to save <laughs> the world or whatever. That's what drew me to the series. That's what made it among my favorites series is it is the most lived in world that i have experienced in literally any video game i've ever played and there's also like hidden quests that you mm -hmm. only get if you talk to everybody all the time there's hidden items that you can collect there's a lot in this game for completionists yes. who want to explore every nook and cranny of a game if final fantasy 13 was just running in a straight line which it was yes then trails is the exact opposite of that yes because you run in a circle because you're in a circle. And you have to talk to people over and over and over and over. If Final Fantasy Thirteen had no NPCs, this has literally hundreds of them. Although you're very right that it's just the the series is a series of duologies, right? So Trails in the Sky One introduces you to this world via Estelle and Joshua, who are teenagers. They are adopted siblings who are secretly in love with each yeah. other which is a trope i hate and i'm just gonna set that to the side for now i'm okay with it in this situation because i'm rarely okay well with i it. mean i'm an only child so i don't have real life i mean i assume i wouldn't be attracted to my brother if i had one but anyway they met so here's why i'm okay with it in this one is because they met when they were like 12 so they were like in puberty already 
what I don't am not okay with, and I know this is jumping ahead, is that I'm not okay in Trails of Cold Steel with Elise being in love with her brother Reen or her adoptive brother Reen because they have been siblings since they were literally toddlers. Yep. They like it's one thing if this person shows up in your life when you're like in your puberty and having like your sexual awakening or whatever. And it's another thing if they're in your life from the time that you are like a literal baby. (laughs) (laughs) I would assume that is true. That is my defense of Estelle and Joshua because I do like them as a couple. They work okay as a couple. You just got to kind of gloss over that whole sibling thing. Although other characters even pointed out that's a little strange. Yeah. Because wait a minute, you're, you're dating, but you have the same dad. What? Yeah. Their dad, by the way, is a world-famous first-class adventurer. Yes. Who used to be a world-famous first-class general. Yeah, he used to And be then he army. goes back to being a general again. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing, just to bring up, that I like about Estelle and Joshua is the how they display the opposite gender's characteristics. Estelle is the more masculine character, who is very athletic, and she uses a bow staff, and she likes sneakers, and she likes collecting bugs, And she likes fishing and she's the masculine one. And then Joshua is like timid and reserved and plays the harmonica and reads. And he has all the feminine characteristics. And I like famous feminine instrument, the harmonica, the harmonica. Yes. And I like how, I like how they switched their gender roles. I think that's very interesting, especially for a game. Cause in Japan, this originally came out in like, 2002 or 2003. So Estelle and Joshua decide when they come of age to join the Bracer Guild. And I thought the Bracer Guild is a really good storytelling idea for a JRPG because the idea of the Bracer Guild is it's an international agency that just helps people with Mm -hmm. whatever. You can go to the Bracer Guild if monsters are eating your crops on your farm Mm -hmm. or if you lost your cat. Or if you can't think of a name for your newborn daughter. Yeah, they're just helpers. Or if a caravan needs an escort. I mean, or I need a recipe for apple pie. Like, the bracers do anything. There should be an app for that. (laughs) There is. It's the Bracer Guild. (laughs) It's, it's, It's a really interesting mechanic. It's a great way to explain why you do all of the weird sub quests and optional quests that are in a lot of JRPGs. Mm -hmm. These now make sense. Of course, they're going to take time out to find this missing cat. They're here to help people. That's what they do. It's also just great for world building in a series that is so heavy on the lore and the world building. And I also, so when I first played this game, I was in my late 20s, I guess. And I was getting a little tired of like the 16-year-old protagonist. But Estelle and Joshua made me understand it. Because in a world this rich, it makes sense that these 16-year-olds would join this sort of organization and it would give them a reason that they would like travel around the country doing things and learning about the world outside their one little community for the first time. And it made me understand why a lot of these games have like a teen protagonist. Because if you were playing as Cassius, despite their dad, despite what a cool character he is, he already knows all about the world. He's, he's, he's like 40-something, and he's been a general, and he already knows everything. But Estelle and Joshua are learning everything for the first time, and they have a good excuse to being in the Bracer Guild. And so, slightly off topic, one thing I really like about this series is Estelle, Lloyd, who's the main character in the Crossbell games, mm-hmm. and Reen, the main character for the Cold Steel games, are all extremely optimistic people. Yeah, that's true. They are all rays of sunshine, and the power of friendship and hope can overcome anything. Mm-hmm. And it's nice to see that in this day and age where it's cooler to be more emo. Yeah. It's mm-hmm. cool to be an anti-hero, to be disaffected, to be too cool. Mm-hmm. Instead, Estelle's just running around like, yeah, of course I'm going to help everybody. Mm-hmm. We can do this. Estelle's so happy. She's such a ball of sunshine. Her last name is Bright. Very on the nose. Yeah, but so is Joshua, and he's well struggling with an inner that's darkness. That's not his, with his original harmonica. last name. His harmonica of darkness. He does have a harmonica of darkness. So, uh, as part of joining the Bracer Guild, they're required to go to all of the regions of their little country of Liberal, Mm -hmm. which is set up 
like a circle around a central lake. So you run around in the circle. You go not to each. O- not ominous at all. No. <laughs> you go to each region, and uh, in each region, there's lots of little quests to do. And then there's the bigger overarching story that kind of connects all the regions mm-hmm. because things are going on. There's terrorism happening. Yes. And in each region, you get uh, a new set of characters to meet. Mm-hmm. And there are some fun characters in this. I like Tita. I like Tita, too. Tita is Tita is a little 12-year-old mechanic genius. And her weapon that she's carrying around is a giant F-off bazooka. Yeah. <laughs> she's like a 12-year-old with a rocket launcher. It's, yeah. It's just a, it's a massive cannon. Mm-hmm. We're not going to talk too much about the combat, because we talk about the combat in the actual reviews. Yeah. But uh, the and com- these games aren't. Yeah, about the combat. But They're the combat the is grid-based and strategic, and uh, I picked Tita as much as I could because she offered a area of effect mm-hmm. range attack, which really lets you mess around with strategies more. That's very true. But I do end up actually just liking the character. I like her a lot. I like in the second game, it'll always stand out to me, she goes to the hot springs town to repair the like generator that makes the water hot, and she sings a little song saying, I'm going to fixy, fixy, fix it. And I think it's very, very cute. Then we have Not Cloud. Yeah, we have Not Cloud. But I like Not Cloud. Agate. Yep. Uh, Olivier. Yeah, Olivier. Or Oliver. Well. Prince Oliver. It's Prince Oliver. But he's her traveling as Olivier. Alias is Olivier. Yeah. Who's a bard with a handgun. Finally, a useful bard. Right. <laughs> I enjoyed having him in the party as well. They're all good. I like all the characters. Scheherazade with her mm-hmm. whip and fortune telling. Yep. Okay. She's the big sister, the big sexy sister character. And she can drink so much alcohol. Yes. Mm-hmm. And then there's a hawk that kind of flies around. I don't remember there being a character attached to the hawk. The best character, close, Sailor Mercury. Who I never use. Sailor Mercury, and I use her all the time. She's the healer, which is, of course, why you never use her. But I love her. But basically, the, the plot is, you know, you run around through all the regions, and you meet all these people, and then... You you find a plot against the country, and of course you stop it and overthrow it and save mm-hmm. the day. And then you get the second game, in which your characters run around the country, <laughs> <laughs> finding subplots and then an overarching plot yeah. of terrorism that connects each region, and then you save the day again. Yeah. Uh, the second game introduces the... Se- well, the first game really introduced it, but the second game explored mm-hmm. the concept of this secret organization of... Yeah. Ouroboros, Ouroboros. I've heard it pronounced both ways, and I don't know which one's right. Um, I say Ouroboros just because they say they it say like it. that. But Red Dwarf says Ouroboros. Yeah, they're probably both fine. I say caramel. Dancing? Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. So the second game is meeting all the same characters again. They added a couple extra ones. They did. Father Kevin... But it really is, God, Father Kevin, I have some issues with Father Kevin in that one because he's in his 20s hitting on the 16-year-old pretty hard. Yeah. And he's a priest. I think it's put on. Although he is an adventure priest. He's like in, yeah. he's a priest like Indiana Jones is an archaeologist. Exactly. I would be into church if it was like the Septian church in the Trails games and I could be an Indiana Jones priest. Yeah. So, yeah, you, they introduced a lot more characters, and you're not... In the first game, you were really limited to, in each region, you get that region's characters, and you don't really get to pick your party till mm-hmm. the end. In the second one, it opens up pretty quick, and you can start using the characters that you were comfortable with. Mm-hmm. And it really is... It's a continuation and a climax to the story that was started in the first yeah. one, which is why we said it's like a duology, because then you come to this third game and it's like the appendix of the first (laughs) of the trails in the sky what the third game really feels like and i said this in the review it feels like a dlc dungeon that after you beat the second game like six months later the company announced a big dlc package and for like 30 bucks you get an add-on dungeon that lets you explore the background of some of the characters right that's what three feels like. Yeah, that's true. It's the shortest of the Trails game. It all takes place in a single dungeon. Admittedly, it's a massive dungeon that has, you know, a whole bunch of mystical stuff on different layers mm-hmm. going on. But it's still a dungeon. There aren't a lot of NPCs to run around and talk to in between right. each moment. True. Uh, there are no towns, really. There are segments of the dungeon that are like towns because you're visiting your own past. Yeah. But you don't get to just go back to them. Right. I liked it because... I mean, 
I think I like three because it cemented how much lore and world building and character building they were going to do in these games. The fact that they created a whole game that's just revisiting the pasts and the memories of its huge cast. I mean, there's like 15 or 16 playable characters. Yeah, it's, in this it's one. big. And the fact that they're putting that much, that much backstory into everybody. I really liked it. I do agree with you that it's not, I mean, it's not my favorite. It doesn't feel like a full game it doesn't. on its own. Yeah. Uh, and it, it's sad because it starts out with Kevin, and I'm like, okay, this could go anywhere because mm-hmm. Kevin is the action priest yeah. who finds dangerous artifacts and you know puts them in a box in a warehouse somewhere. He is the Indiana Jones of priests. And it's like, okay, cool. He's found this cool artifact, and he's sucked into a dungeon where they all explore each other's memories. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, <laughs> that's the true. whole game. I can see that be dis- being disappointing. Yeah. Although what's interesting is... There's all sorts of mini games and everything hidden in the third game. One of them, there's a mystical door that you go through and you can play blackjack. Yeah. <laughs> and you learn the, the story of a famous gambler mm-hmm. and the girl who wants to meet the famous gambler. And both of those characters are apparently going to be I in... I was going to say, this is the thing I love about the game, is because those characters are in the newest game, yeah, which is which, only out in Japan right now. Yeah. But they are actually in the game. And there were and besides the gambling game in Sky 3, they there are two books cuz every game has you have to find the hidden books. A ch- series hidden book. of books, chapters of a book. Um and you read these stories and there are two books that their names are Jack and Hallie and there were two books that were about these characters and then all of a sudden literally 11 games later now they're, they're showing characters. up in person and they're actual characters in the new game so uh yeah the trails in the sky series takes place in the tiny country of liberal mm-hmm. never i mean always something's up if your country is a circle <laughs> if your country is, there's always something in the middle of that there's circle. something in the middle of the circle especially if there's four towers um, sitting at each of the cardinal directions of your circular country. Yeah, at that point, you need to move to another country. Yeah, you should know something's up. Maybe an empire. There's a, those are always good. <laughs> right. <laughs> Empires are never evil. No. Nope. So yeah, that's really the first three games is a duology and a DLC dungeon. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying don't play the DLC dungeon. I'm just saying I, I got into it expecting I was going to have another experience like I'd had so far with these yeah. big games with rich NPCs and so much story. And instead, it was mostly, it was learning memories and backstory about already existing characters, which was interesting. Mm-hmm. It gave more depth to the characters, but it's not the experience I went in expecting. That said, I really enjoyed the in-boss sequence. Mm -hmm. So that was fun because it split up your party members uh, to attack the final dungeon in like three different groups. Yeah, 16 characters. Yeah, four different groups. Four different groups. Mm -hmm. And luckily, uh, the Tail series, the Trail series, has a really nice leveling mechanic where the. The, diff- the level differential between you and the enemies determines how much XP you get. Mm-hmm. I, as long as I made sure to have like one or two characters that I used a lot in each party, the rest of the characters leveled up to a good level pr- in like two or three yeah, combats. Very, very quickly. Mm-hmm. So, which is nice. Uh, if you're going to let me pick my own characters, I'm just going to usually pick like four characters, and those are my characters yeah. for the whole game. Mm-hmm. Then you want me to use everybody. Well, <laughs> at least you gave me a way to do that. Thank right, you. Exactly. What else do we have to say about the Trails in the Sky series? I, I mean, I, I, it just it it's great because it started my love of a great series overall. I mean, there are eleven games. There are eleven games in the series now, and now we've addressed three of them. <laughs> right. So, uh, in next month's side quest, we will address the Crossbell duology. Yes. So we my was, favorite. Yes, I actually kind of mine. I'm not sure. Cold Steel, I liked a lot. Oh, we'll talk about. Yeah, that. We'll I have there. I have feeling new feelings about Cold Steel. Okay, so we will see you guys next time. All Thank right. you for listening. Ciao. I'm out this moist. There we go. Never fails. I am very moist. Thank you for the bloopers. You're welcome. Are you as moist 
as The Rock no in The Fast and no, the Furious 5. No, no one is as moist as The Rock in Fast Fast 5. Um, no, nobody is that moist. Every scene, he looked like he'd just been swimming. Mm-hmm. Do they have somebody offset who just dumped a bucket of water on his head before every I, scene? I think it was Vin Diesel. <laughs> it probably was. He's like... I need The Rock to appear to have a perspiration issue. <laughs> he needs to look wetter. I need to look drier. It's Make it happen. Be, yeah. Vin Diesel is not a good actor. Please don't hate us, Vin Diesel. Um, I Am Groot is the most he has ever shown emotion. I feel like we're spending a lot of this podcast talking about Vin Diesel now. <laughs> he has ever played. Um, yet we are, because I have a lot of feelings about The Fast and the Furious. You have only seen two of the movies. And that was enough to give me a lot of feelings. I've seen five of them now. I'm sorry. Me too. I'm sorry. I can't wait to see who Shaw is. Jason Statham. Yeah, but I mean, what role does he play in this very... Complex Lore-heavy, yes, complex cinematic universe. Only time will tell. That's remarkably unpleasant. Please, please stop. We will go back to using the video camera if this is what... (laughs) I will throw all of this audio equipment in the trash. For the love of God, that is... Awful. (laughs) That is just miserable. Uh.